Okay, Father, we thank you. I thank you for this man of God. I thank you, Father, that he is open to your Holy Spirit and what you have to say. Father, that's all he asks for and that's all you've given him. So by your Holy Spirit, fill him from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Let his mouth be open and open to what the Holy Spirit wants to say. And that is spirit and truth, Lord, your word. Thank you that it is opened up for us, Father, to receive. Just bless him, Lord, Father, for serving you and serving us. In your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can I work in it? Give me one second just to set up. Now. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. What a blessing it is to be up here and, and speaking to you all. Thank you, Mike, and the worship team. That was that was excellent. Sorry, that's my pen. Uh, the notes I made. Okay. So today we will be talking about something that is mentioned quite a lot in these four walls, and that is spiritual maturity. And this goes hand in hand with how intimate we are with Christ. Our maturity level and our intimacy with him are extremely connected. Thankfully, God has revealed to us a few ways in which we can test how mature we are. We don't need to guess. When you head to your annual check at the doctor, I personally don't do them, but I hear it's quite common. One of the first things you may ask you to do is to stick out your tongue. And this is for a good reason. The tongue says a lot about the overall health of the patient. Any good doctor will tell you just how fascinating it is and how much you can learn simply by examining the tongue. They can easily tell a healthy person from one who is not. It is the same with us spiritually. Our new life, our salvation, our transformation will show up in the way that we speak. Our tongue and our speech shows what is truly in our hearts. Either springs of life will flow out, as the Proverbs say, or every evil thing. Our reading today will be from James chapter 3, so please open up your Bibles with me. James was a half-brother of Jesus Christ, a leader of the early church in Jerusalem, and his short book is filled with wisdom. James wants to get into our business as followers of Christ and challenge the way in which we live. The book is stamped with practical wisdom, both from the book of Proverbs and from the teachings of Jesus. James challenges believers to a wholehearted devotion to Jesus and leads them into a place of maturity. And this is the same challenge I bring to you this morning. As we go through the passage today, examine yourself using your tongue as an indicator and see how intimate with Christ you truly are. So let's look at the text, James 3, 1 to 12. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world. Of iniquity. 
The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? No, no, thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Amen. Amen. So what a piece of convicting scripture. There is such a need for our speech to be tamed. We have the power to, to speak both life and death with our tongue, both blessing and cursing. So this morning we're going to make our way through the text with God's help. James is telling us here that a living and true faith, a saving faith, shows itself in the control and sanctification of our tongue. It is not the only way in which our faith is demonstrated, but it certainly is a way. This is a follow-up from James chapter 2, where we find that very famous verse, that faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Now there's quite a lot of distorted teaching that comes from that verse. People trying to mix both grace and works in salvation. And it's wrong. If you add anything to grace, it's no longer grace. You are saved by grace alone through faith alone. But what James is saying here is that a true faith, a living faith will bear fruit and will produce good works. The works themselves do not justify nor save us. They are simply the effects and signs that we truly have the faith we openly confess. Faith in Christ changes every fibre of our being. And we simply cannot live in the same manner we were living in before. So naturally, the way that we speak and the words that we say will be changed. As the doctor, James is asking to see our tongues, to check our spiritual state, to examine our heart posture. There is no better test of the inward character than the condition of the tongue. Jesus said that it is out of the abundance of our heart that our mouth speaks. Through our speech we are justified and through our speech we are condemned. So this chapter starts by giving a sober warning to those who are to be teachers in the church. They must take the responsibility seriously because they shall receive the greater judgment. Teachers are constantly guiding and advising others. It's so easy to speak in error or a misjudgment or to speak inappropriately into someone's lives or to misrepresent Christ or the Holy Spirit. The warning comes because many people want to throw themselves into this office when God has not called them there. They love being seen, they love being heard and praised by men, but they are blinded by failing to see the bigger picture that they will receive a more harsh judgment. We're all commonly weak. We all stumble in many things, especially when it comes to our tongues. The teacher is prone to mistakes. In fact, the teacher will make mistakes. And yet their sin is still judged more heavily. So it's unwise to throw yourself into that position unless you have been truly called by God. This warning can also be taken more broadly. We are all called to teach. It's not merely speaking to the preacher or formal teachers. 
whenever we are in a position of ministering to others, giving advice to brothers and sisters, teaching in a small group, or even to our children this warning holds. If we offer bad counsel or ungodly advice, it can lead one into disobedience, into sin, or even to fall away. That is both a dangerous and a shameful thing. Yet on the other hand, a good word in its season, an encouraging word to the member that is struggling, a gentle rebuke when a brother or sister falls into sin, or a teaching that edifies its hearers is a good thing, is a fruitful thing. And James wants us to understand the power of the tongue and the necessity to control it. Let's look at verse 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in words, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. The perfect man would better translate to a spiritually mature man. The idea isn't someone who is perfectly sinless, but a man who does not continue to stumble with his mouth or his words. Someone who is slow to speak and to contain their tongue. Now that is a man who has reached spiritual maturity. He is like Christ in speech and conduct. And that should be our goal. And we see this maturity in speech all throughout the scriptures. Moses was fearful to speak the words of God when he encountered him in the burning bush. Forty years later, he preached a series of sermons recorded in the book of Deuteronomy to all of Israel, over two million people. Paul accused the church. He persecuted them and even condemned them to death. After his conversion, he could do nothing but praise and worship God and dedicate his life to preach the gospel and edify the brethren. These are drastic changes and only possible by the grace and power of God. Do you see that in your life? If we want to bring our whole spiritual life under control, we first must acknowledge what comes out of our mouth. It's such a practical lesson. If we can speak that which is holy, if we can speak that which is good and that which gives life, if the Holy Spirit gets control of the most dangerous and volatile member of our bodies, the rest will be subdued. The rest will follow. Jamestown switches to illustrate the power of the tongue with these three brilliant pictures. Can you please put James three, three to six back up? Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large, and are driven by fierce winds. They are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The first two here offer similar explanations. The bit and the rudder are both small but extremely crucial parts. If they are not controlled, or should we say not controlled well, being on either the horse or the ship will be a very dangerous place to be. It is possible for something so small and so seemingly unimportant in the grand scheme of things to have tremendous power for either good or evil. To get your horse to be useful, you have to break them. They will then be able to be ridden, to plough a field, or to pull a wagon, all by controlling that small piece of metal that sits just above the tongue. What an analogy. But without that, they are useless to their master, and unbroken 
and an unbridled horse is good for nothing. Just like the horse, we have to be broken. The natural, unregenerated, fleshly man cannot control his tongue. It says that first, a few verses down, that no man can tame the tongue. Christ says that whoever comes to him, whoever falls upon him, will be broken. When we surrender to Christ, old things pass away and all things are made new. And by the power of his spirit, he can then control our tongue. It is only when Christ is holding the reins can the tongue be tamed. And once the tongue is tamed, the whole body will follow. The illustration of ships shows the same point. Back then they had big ships also. It wasn't just small fishing boats. In Acts 27 there was a ship with 276 people on it. And the word says that it's all turned by a small rudder wherever the captain desires. When the captain has control over the rudder, he has control over the whole ship. And when Christ has control over your tongue, he has control over the entirety of your body. Let us know what James is not saying here. He's not saying to take a vow of silence and never to speak again. In a lot of ways, that would be much easier. But boats that are left in ports and horses that never leave their stable are again useless to their owners. Every word we speak has consequences, but every silence does too. We must openly speak about the things of God. God wants to use your tongue for his glory. He wants to, he wants to bear fruit with our tongues. He wants us to be a spring that only brings forth fresh water and no bitterness. The world is getting darker, much darker. You can see that from what's going on around us morally and the complete and utter devastation that's happening in Israel. We live in a wicked world. And it's in these times that we need to step up as ambassadors of Christ and speak truth and life. The coming day of Christ's return is nearing and we must, we must be set apart. God wants to use all of your body for his righteousness. It isn't only the tongue. He wants all of you. Romans 6.13, can you please? Thanks, Norman. Romans 6.13 tells us, And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Paul here is giving a very similar message to James. He's offering practical wisdom on how to walk with Christ, on, on how to be a Christian and walk in that new freedom. You've got eyes? Brilliant. Set them on godly things. The light of the body is in the eye, so keep yourselves from looking at darkness. You've got hands? Be quick to give. You've got feet? Fantastic. Be quick to bring the gospel of peace. But James hones in on the fact that the tongue is like the Goliath of your bodies. It is the most powerful. Once that is tamed, once that is defeated, the rest of the body, as the army of the Philistines, will bow. You can then present all of your members as instruments of righteousness. Think for a moment. What kind of words do you speak? Is your speech the same on a Sunday as it is with your family, your wife, or at your workplace? I'm not here to judge nor make you feel bad over a couple of slip-ups of the tongue. But what are you practicing? Words of life that lead to life? Or words of death 
that lead to destruction. And we're told to examine ourselves to see whether or not we are truly in the faith. And our speech does not lie. <coughs> it's convicting. <coughs> convicted me preparing this sermon. But we need to press on to maturity. And to press on, we need to see where we are currently standing. Christ is coming back, and he's coming back for a spotless and a blameless bride. Amen. Yes. Are the words you speak those which are gracious, kind, loving? Are you speaking words of blessing, words of humility, words of wisdom, encouragement, and thanksgiving? Or are we boasting, exaggerating, criticizing, gossiping, slandering, and using words of flattery? Are we manipulating, swearing, or even speaking blasphemy? Or perhaps a mix of both? These things ought not to be so. In those who are born again, it shouldn't be that out of the same mouth proceed both blessing and cursing. Let this be an encouragement to press into Christ. We have the power to speak both death life and death, to build up or to tear down. And let's be wise. So we've looked at the ship and the horse. The third picture represents the tongue as fire. It brings such destruction. It brings everything down. It can take a second to burn a bridge that has taken years to build. You may remember, if you're from an English household, that old rhyme of, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Now what a lie that is. The bitter pain of a spoken word against us can hurt us for a lifetime, long after a broken bone is healed. A discouraging word from a father can scar. A hurtful comment from a husband can cause bitterness. And slander can destroy a man's reputation. Harsh and cruel words can cause one to feel unworthy, unloved, and unnoticed. How many ministries have been torn down by gossip? Christian gossip, what a contradiction, but it is rife. Look with me for a moment at the book of Jude, another one of Christ's half-brothers. Thanks, Lord. Jude gives a really interesting piece of scripture in Jude 1, 9 to 10. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring up against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these, speaking of um, certain men who have crept into the church, speak evil of whatever they do not know. And whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Jude here is comparing the Archangel Michael's conduct of speech against certain men who have crept into the church and have defiled themselves with their tongues. We see here that Michael and the devil are contending over something to do with Moses' body. It's quite interesting as it's a unique part of scripture. This back and forth between him and the devil isn't mentioned anywhere else in the Bible, to my knowledge. But we won't go into that today. The main point isn't why Michael was, dis was disputing, but how he disputed. Michael dared not bring a reviling accusation against the devil. He didn't mock him, nor did he accuse him, nor did he rebuke him in his own strength, but battled against him in the name of the Lord. 
Now, if Michael dared not bring a reviling accusation against Satan himself, how much more should we, people who are made in the image of God, not speak evil of one another? We can be so quick to judge and quick to bring accusations against even our brothers and sisters. If you are ever a part of conversations where there is gossip or slander, and, and you will be, it's in those times that you need to stand for righteousness yeah. and push for unity in the body of Christ. Yeah. If you're not a part of the solution, you are a part of the problem. And if you are one spreading these things, Scripture warns us, everything that is said in the darkness will be made known in the light. And Christ said that every idle word men may speak, they will give an account for it in the day of judgment. So we've looked at the three pictures, the horse, the boat, and the fire, demonstrating the power of the tongue to control our bodies and ultimately be used for either good or evil. Now James moves on to talk about the difficulty of taming the tongue. As we read earlier, only the spiritual mature man can tame their tongue by the grace of God. It is difficult to grow in spiritual maturity. It doesn't happen in an instant or from a single prayer. It requires patience, obedience, discipline, endurance, a life of denying oneself and pressing into Christ. It's hard, and you need to want him. You need to love him. When we do prevail and reach maturity, we are promised that we can master the tongue, and therefore can overcome all the evil tendencies throughout the whole body. This is because the tongue instantly expresses what's in our hearts. It sins more readily and more often than any other body part. It responds immediately, it responds quickly to sin. We tend to speak without thinking. And if we can control that desire, the slower responding body parts will also be controlled. If you are stuck in continual ongoing sin, don't focus on the sin, cut it off. Press into Christ through prayer and the reading of his word, and he will lead you to repentance. As you mature and as you grow closer to him, the sin will become less. The truth is, if you aren't actively moving closer to Christ, you are slipping away. That's a dangerous place to be. And this is where we come to the power of the gospel. It is the same gospel that saves us, that keeps us, and that sanctifies us. It's only the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that can help us. That has the power to transform us, and without it there is absolutely no hope. Can we please have the scripture from 1 Peter? If you've got your Bible, it's 1 Peter 2, 21 to 24. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. God, in his goodness and mercy, sent forth his Son. He is the only one who has never sinned never spoke even an idle word. 
nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Christ was judged in our place. He bore all of our sin, every wicked word that we have ever spoken. He took it on himself, the just for the unjust, once and for all. All of us like sheep had gone astray. Each of us had gone our own way, but God laid upon him the iniquity of his all. Christ suffered on that tree on our behalf. He died, was buried, and he rose up again on the third day, that all who repent and put their faith in him may live. And not only live, but he gives everything that we need to live righteously by his spirit who dwells in us. And that is the grace of God. We are called to follow in his footsteps. And as God's children, we are called to bear the family name. Saints, let our speech always be seasoned with salt. And let us be sanctified by that very same gospel which saved us. I'm going to conclude today on a slightly different tone. And with this picture. Many Christians can be officially set free by Christ, yet still imprisoned by their past. When a person lives in a prison for years, he completes his sentence and then is set free. They often still look and act and think like a prisoner. They live in the same routine day after day and nothing changes. This illustrates the experience of many Christians today. Jesus sets them free and they can walk in that freedom from sin whenever they choose to deny themselves and submit to God. But since they keep going back and yielding their body to the lust of the flesh. They live a life filled with defeat and discouragement and imprisonment. <coughs> and because of this, they have a paralyzed walk with Christ with little or no maturing. And this doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be. Many of us are imprisoned by believing the lies from our past and crippled of shame. Words entangle people in lives, in lies even, that were never meant to define them. But God, He heals the brokenhearted and He binds up our wounds. He goes to unexpected places and unimaginable lengths to make all things new. There is no heart too broken. There is no sadness too strong and no hurt too deep for Christ to heal. Offer it up to him, for he is faithful and you can believe his promises. There will be times even after today when somebody will say something hurtful to you or even behind your back. And it's in those times that we must guard our hearts and not let that seed of bitterness or anger or offence to come in. Deal with your adversary quickly. The way to maturity in Christ is, for, is through obedience and submission to him. And the way to freedom is to look unto him who hung upon the cross for you, who bore it all that we may live. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just offer our hearts up to you. Father, we pray that you will bring healing and restoration where that is needed. And we pray that you will bring conviction and repentance where that is necessary. Help us, Lord, become beacons of light 
in this work, in this wicked and perverse generation, Lord. And let there not be any hypocrisy even named among us, Lord. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Going to conclude with. Amen. We're going to conclude with this song. While it's playing, let's pray that God will minister to your hearts. Amen. Thank you.